I was told to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he doesn't need an introduction, but I feel like I need to say something. Uh, Bob Wright, longtime uh, friend of uh, GES, uh, was a longtime uh, uh, disciple uh, of Zane. Uh, Zane mentored him, and he is the pastor of Cypress Valley Baptist Church. He's been on the board. Oh, oh, Bible Church. See, Baptist. I got the Baptist up. Bible Church. And uh, been on the board, just uh, he's always does a great job here. So I'll come and uh, tell us what's going on. It's always good to be here, it's great to be back. And I learned something new the first uh, day on Monday, and I'd like to publicly thank Steve Thurman because he, he taught me something I didn't know. And it, it really meant a lot to me. What I learned from Steve on Monday was, uh, you're allowed to show pictures of your grandchildren. And uh, thank you, Steve, that, that meant a lot. And I hadn't planned on it, but decided to do it. And, uh, but unlike Steve, I'm only gonna show one. And, uh, but I need to introduce the picture. It's a picture that was taken on Thanksgiving Day of our family, there were eight adults and, or, yeah, eight adults and eight children in the uh, family picture. And my uh, children, I want to mention on the side, every time they come, they bring their dogs with them. So that's relevant to what I'm about to say. So we're all set up for the picture. And my daughter-in-law set the camera, you know, where it, she could punch a button and let it time, and she could run around and get in the picture. And while she was, when she got back there, the camera started clicking. And as soon, I kid you not, as soon as the camera started clicking, the big dog and the little dog came under the camera and the big dog decided to get romantic, if you know what I mean, with the little dog. It's unbelievable, the timing of this. And uh, with that as an introduction, here's the picture. Sixteen people have never laughed harder and never will laugh harder in our lives than in that picture. Now, <clears throat> that, that was one of the great split seconds in the life of our family, one that we will cherish as long as we live. And what, a, what an introduction that is to the topic of my message. That critical split second in Abraham's life, it doesn't have anything to do with the one that we just experienced in the picture. But that's the critical split second in Abraham's life, and it has everything to do with everybody in this room and everybody in the world. Because that critical split second in Abraham's life is a model for everyone in the world who has ever lived. Some people have experienced that same critical split second in their lives. Some people will someday experience that critical split second. They just haven't yet. Sadly, most people will never experience that critical split second that Abraham experienced in his life. Now, it's important for us to, to understand the, the critical split second we need to go back and think about what happened in Abraham's life before that critical split second because it gives meaning to the set split second itself. And we need to go back when, to when God first spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He was living in Ur over here on the right of the screen. And God told him to leave his country, his family, his father, his father's house, and go to a land that he promised to him the land of Canaan, and the way to get there was to travel up the Mediterranean to Haran and then down south to Canaan. And God said to Abraham, if you do that, here's what I promise you, and these are the highlights of the promises. The Lord had said to Abram, I'll make you a great nation, I will bless you, you shall be a blessing, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham said, that sounds great. 
especially that first part, I'll make you a great nation. I'm not sure how much Abraham understood about all the other promises at that point, but I know he got that point. He was going to have a son, because to have a nation, you have to have a son through which you can have descendants to form the nation. And Abraham, in my mind, just had to have believed that God was going to give him a son, otherwise he wouldn't have left, because... Can you imagine Abraham saying, well, I just, I really don't believe that, but I'll, I'll walk a thousand miles and go to Canaan. I don't believe that's going to happen, but I'll go there anyway. It's highly likely in my mind for certain that Abraham had to have believed at least that part of it, that someday he's going to have a son. And what he was so excited about was he was in his early 70s, probably 70, that's uh, what I think, uh, early 70s for sure, but probably 70. And uh, still hadn't had a son, and his wife, Sarah, was 60. She, uh, you know, they're, they're getting pretty old, too old to have a son, but they, God made the promise, we're going to step out and go. And Abraham left, went to Canaan, and when you read Genesis 12 through 14, it's amazing what you see. Chapter 12, 13, and 14, here's a summary of what happened in those three chapters. God does good works for Abraham, and Abraham does good works for God. And it's a pretty impressive list of these things that are happening. These are just the highlights in just one word at a time. We already saw that God made promises to Abraham. Abraham stepped out, believing those promises, at least that first one, and went a thousand miles to Canaan. And when he got there, he built altars of worship to God. And he went down to Egypt, got in trouble. God brought plagues to deliver Abraham. I mean, that's a big deal what God did for Abraham. Brought those plagues to deliver him out uh, from what was about to happen when he got kind of in a mess with Sarah. You, You know the story. When he got back, God reiterated the promises to Abraham about the land and about the nation. And in the meantime, his nephew, uh, Lot, got captured by four kings and their armies, and Abraham, in faith, stepped out with his little, I don't know, he didn't have it, I guess he had it, he formed an army from his household and went up there, and through the miracle of God, he rescued Lot and overcame those armies of those four kings. That was a great work of God and a great step of faith, and when he got back, Melchizedek came to meet him. God sent Melchizedek to meet him and bless him, and Abraham paid tithes, offered tithes to Melchizedek. And then after that, the king of Sodom said, I want to pay you a lot of money for what you just did for our nation when you, uh, you know, conquered those four kings. And he wanted to give him money. And Abraham said, no, I don't want people saying you made me rich, implying I want people to know God made me rich. Now that's a great resume of God doing good works for Abraham and Abraham doing good works for God. Wouldn't you agree? Pretty impressive. Really impressive. Now, it's not perfect because I left out a couple of things. When he left Ur and went to Canaan, he stayed in Haran for probably maybe up to five years because he didn't do what God said. He didn't leave his father. He brought his father with him. His father worshiped other gods. His father convinced him to stay in Haran, delaying his uh, coming to Canaan, and that was wrong. Abraham disobeyed God during that time. And we already mentioned when he got down there to Egypt and lied about Sarah, saying she's my sister, but pretty good resume, even though it wasn't perfect. That's Genesis 12, 13, and 14. When we come to chapter 15, we are about to see that critical split second. Up until now, we've seen what happened before the, that critical split second. Now we're about to see what happens in that critical split second and the minutes leading up to that split second. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Now Abraham points out, the problem. I go childless. And this is 15 years later from the time that he stepped out and left Ur. He's 85 years old, and he's recognizing or admitting or uh, sharing with God the obvious. I go child. I don't have a child. 
Obviously, I'm not going to have a child. We both know that. I know that. You know that, Lord. Uh, I don't believe, what, it, what's, what I'm interjecting here, he didn't believe that promise anymore. It's pretty clear in what he's about to say. Because he said, Lord, this is what I think you need to do. I've got an idea that I think you'll like. I've got this boy in the house. His name's Eliezer. He's a child of one of our servants uh, whom we uh, picked up in Damascus. And uh, he didn't say, could he be the heir? He said, he is the heir. Lord, this is the plan. Here it is. I'm sure you'll like it. Aren't you proud of me? And uh, the Lord says, no, I'm not, I'm not going with that. The Lord says, behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. God is reiterating the promise that he made 15 years before back in Ur. This is the way it's going to be. He's going to be your physical descendant not Eliezer. Well, just as God wasn't impressed with Abraham's plan, Abraham wasn't buying God's plan either. We know that because God had to still work to convince Abraham to believe this promise. And this is what God did. He brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Notice he told him to count the stars. Have you ever tried to do that? Lots of luck. You can't do it. It's impossible. There are just too many on a clear night. You can, you, Abraham couldn't do it. And God says, that's the point. You can't count them. And that's how many descendants you're going to have. It's kind of like God is saying, you know, I promised you'd have a great nation, but I want you to know, I'm not kidding. It's going to be bigger than you can imagine what I want to do through you and through your descendants. <clears throat> Would Abraham believe now that God had given him this exercise of counting the stars? You know the answer, yes. He believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Let me ha And that, in that moment, that was that critical split second in Abraham's life. I want to emphasize two words here, believed and righteous. Before that critical split second, Abraham did not believe, or had stopped believing, I should say. At that moment, at the moment, minutes leading up, or for maybe months or years, he didn't believe that promise. But in that critical split second, he believed. Before that critical split second, Abraham was not righteous in the sight of God. But in that critical split second that he believed, God accounted it to him for righteousness. Simple illustration, this finger represents Abraham before the critical split second in and of himself. He was not righteous, he was sinful in the sight of God. This hand represents the righteousness of God. In the critical split second that Abraham believed, he was covered with the righteousness of God. God accounted it to him for righteousness. That's the way God saw him from that point forward and forevermore as righteous in his sight. Now, this critical split second that we read about in Genesis 15, 6 is emphasized in the New Testament. Obviously, it's a critical one of the most critical passages in the whole Scripture. We know that because of the repetition of it in the New Testament. Romans chapter 4, Paul says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, Paul says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. James chapter 2, James says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Obviously, this is pretty important. Abraham is a model for people that would follow. That Abraham believed God and was accounted him for righteousness and these New Testament writers in particular, Paul, used this as a model to explain this truth as a model for all who would also believe and be counted for righteousness. In fact, let's look at what Paul said in uh, Romans chapter, excuse me, Galatians. Okay, I got, I got to keep track. Galatians chapter chapter 3, 
where, uh, no, still in Romans chapter 4. I put the references on your sheet. I didn't put them on the slides, and I know that might be highly offensive to many, but please forgive me. All right. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him for righteousness. And Paul emphasizes this verse by making sure we understand what it means that he believed. Paul goes on to say in the chapter that Abraham, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. I want to highlight believed and fully convinced because Paul wants us to know what it means that he believed. It means he was fully convinced of what? What God had promised. And Paul goes on, uh, or, or this helps us to understand the beginning of the definition or the understanding of this critical split second. The critical split second in Abraham's life, if, we could, if I could state it simply, was when he believed God's promise. It's when he believed God's promise. But that leads to an important question. What promise? Now, we might think, well, it must have been the promise that he was going to have a son. But you know what? That leads to a couple of problems in my mind. He believed he was going to have a son, I'm convinced, back 15 years before when he left Ur. He wouldn't have left Ur if he didn't believe he was going to have a son. And God didn't pronounce him or account it for righteousness when he believed 15 years before. But even another problem is, if Abraham is a model for all those who would believe, what kind of a model is that? If what he had to believe was believe he had a son, who does God... Who, to whom else in ever has God accounted it for righteousness by believing that you're going to have a son? You know, there's, what's going on here? This sounds strange. We need some explanation. And so, sure enough, that critical split second is explained. In your notes, it says examined. We could put both words. That critical split second is explained and examined uh, by Paul. And by Jesus, as we'll see in a moment. Now, Paul explains it. I want to start out in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, where Paul says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he explains it in verse 8, when he said God preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Now that first verse happened in Genesis 15, but that preaching of the gospel happened in chapter 12. That first verse happened when he was 85. That second verse happened when he was 70, 15 years before. God preached the God, look at that. God preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, 15 years beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Now we need to think, what does, what does Paul mean by gospel, that God preached the gospel to Abraham? Now I've just given you part of verse 8. Here's all of verse 8. And the scripture for saying that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. What does Paul mean by gospel in Galatians 3.8? It's right there. Justification by faith. It's the gospel of justification by faith. So going back to the condensed version, God preached the gospel to Abraham, the gospel of justification by faith. But that's not all. Paul is referring to the gospel, but he'd already referred to the gospel earlier in James in chapter 1 when he referred to the gospel as the gospel of Christ, the gospel from Christ, the gospel about Christ. So what is the gospel of Christ? What is the core of the gospel of Christ? Well, let's let Christ tell us. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That's the core of the gospel, the good news about how people are justified by faith. Jesus said it. One condition to believe in him 
for everlasting life. So now going back, I want to just highlight as simply as I can, what did Abraham believe? He believed the gospel, the gospel of Christ. That gospel was preached to him when he was in Ur in Genesis chapter 12. Now let me flesh this out as as I'm going to attempt to just kind of paraphrase what I think God was saying. You know, the only thing we've got in Genesis 12 is, in you all the nations shall be blessed. But God obviously said a lot more than that. Paul's telling us that God said a lot more than that when he preached the gospel to Abraham. What he said was, if I could paraphrase, Abraham, you're going to have a son, and through your son there will be descendants, and one of your descendants will be the Christ. And anyone down through time who believes in him for everlasting life will have it. Including you, Abraham. This is what you need to do, is believe in the coming Christ for everlasting life. But Abraham didn't believe it. We know that. Abraham heard the gospel beforehand, but he didn't believe that gospel for 15 years until Genesis 15, 6, when finally he believed the gospel that had been preached to him beforehand 15 years before, the gospel of Christ. Now, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Jesus said something about that event. In John 8, 56, Jesus said that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. I believe Jesus is commenting on the very moment that that critical split second occurred in Abraham's life. The moment he believed, he rejoiced. And he was glad. Why? Because for the first time in his life, he had assurance of everlasting life through faith in the coming Christ for that life. What a great moment that was. Jesus tells us that he rejoiced and was glad. So now we can go back and add to our definition of that critical split second in Abraham's life. It's when he believed in God, when he believed God's promise, specifically the promise of everlasting life through faith in Jesus. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Here I want us to think about Paul making that statement in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. And as you may make it, I want to raise a question about what I've shared already, and that is, why did it take Abraham so long to believe? Why, why did God preach the gospel to him in chapter tw- Genesis 12? He didn't believe till Genesis 15. God preached the gospel to him when he was 70. Why, didn't he, why, why, was it, why was it 15 years before he believed the gospel when he was 85? What was going on in his life that hindered him from believing? In Romans chapter 4, I believe Paul gives us the answer because in Romans chapter 4, it's all about Abraham in that first part of the chapter. I want you to notice, here's uh, 4.3. Look at the verse that comes before it, verse 2, and the verse that comes shortly after it, verse 5. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. Now let me highlight the repetition of works. Works and does not work. Before we read that Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness, Paul mentions if Abraham was justified by works. I think Paul is telling us that that was Abraham's problem. He thought he could be justified by works. It makes sense that uh, Abraham had seen God do all these good works for him, and he'd seen himself do all these good works for God. In fact, Abraham may have been the one that said, I've got something to boast about. Look at my resume. Did you all see the list of the things that happened between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15? I mean, that's a pretty good resume of works that I've done for God, and God was doing good works for me too. I think God looks at me as a righteous man. 
And so he could have had something to boast about. But as Paul tells us, not before God. Because God would have reminded him, and I'm sure God probably did, Abraham, you're a sinful man. You got a pretty good resume in those 15 years, but remember what you did when you, you didn't leave your father and your father worshipped other gods, and because of that you wouldn't leave Haran and go to Canaan. Remember what you did when you went to Egypt and lied about Sarah being your sister? I mean, uh, you don't have a whole lot to boast about because you're not perfect. You cannot be accounted righteous in my sight because you're not in and of yourself. And Abraham had to get from thinking that he could be justified by works to believing that it's given to the one who does not work, to the one who finally understands that it's his faith that is accounted as righteousness. And I'm reminding you again, these two verses surround this verse. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So now we can go back to our definition of that critical split second in Abraham's life. It was when he believed God's promise of everlasting life through faith in Jesus, totally apart from trusting in his works. That critical split second in Abraham's life was when he believed God's promise of everlasting life through faith in Jesus, totally apart from trusting in his works. And Paul goes on to say that that critical split second in Abraham's life is the same critical split second in your life. He goes on to say it in these words. It is a faith so that the promise might be sure to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. Notice these words, those who are of the faith of Abraham. The promise is for those who are of the faith of Abraham, meaning those that have experienced that same critical split second that Abraham experienced by believing in Jesus for everlasting life, totally apart from trusting in any good work. And if you've believed in Jesus for everlasting life, totally apart from trusting in any good work, you're of the faith of Abraham. And Paul puts it another way, Abraham is the father of us all. Abraham is the model for us all. All of us that have believed in Jesus for everlasting life, totally apart from trusting in our works, we are children of Abraham in the faith dimension. And it doesn't matter what nation you're from, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, where you live, what your race is, Abraham is the father of many nations of those that have experienced that same critical split second that he did. That critical split second in Abraham's life is that critical split second in your life. That critical split second in Abraham's life was when he believed God's promise of everlasting life through faith in Jesus, totally apart from trusting in his works. Now let's talk about you and me. That critical split second in your life was when you believed God's promise of everlasting life through faith in Jesus, totally apart from trusting in your works. And notice I use the word was. That critical split second in your life was when you believed. And I'm hoping and want to assume that everybody in this room, that that word was is true of you. You've already experienced that critical split second. That, that critical split second is something you've already experienced. It was when you believed. There are others that will one day experience that critical split second. They just haven't yet. As I mentioned at the beginning, sadly, most will never experience this critical split second. Now, I think this is very relevant for all of us because I'm, I know that we all have relatives and friends that have not experienced that critical split second in their life. And yet, 
we could look at their lives and say, well, they look like they have. Let me tell you something. Abraham was a... If we, the, the, the theme of the conference is salvation and discipleship. If, if discipleship means a follower of God, then Abraham... When, when was Abraham a disciple? He was a disciple from Genesis 12. He was a disciple before the critical split second because he really followed God. And he was a disciple after the critical split second when he continued to follow God. And so we could look at Abraham's life and say, ah, man, he's been a disciple since he was 70 years old. He's been a disciple since Genesis 12. And he was. He was an unsaved disciple and then a saved disciple. And the criti that critical split second is what made all the difference. And I'm telling you, you know it, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all have people that we know and love that are disciples of Jesus, and yet they have not experienced that critical split second. They're unsaved disciples, and that's, if that sounds like a strange term to you, uh, John chapter 6, you'll find it in John chapter 6, John chapter 2 as well. People that were unsaved disciples. Now, some of those unsaved disciples believed. Some of them never believed, as we learn in John chapter 6. We cannot assume that people have experienced the critical split second just because we see them following God. How can we know? We have to talk to them. We have to ask them what they believe. We can't make that judgment based on what we see in their lives. We can't do it with Abraham, for sure, and we can't do it with those that we know and love. Okay, what questions might you have? Would you say most will never experience that critical moment? Yes, because Jesus said that the way is broad that leads to destruction. The way is narrow that leads to life. Okay, follow up to that. In other words, what's the basis for saying most of humanity will not be saved? That's, that's I guess I answered that. Tried to. Who spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and Genesis 15, 1 to 6? God the Father or the pre-incarnate Christ, probably the pre-incarnate Christ. How does uh, Hebrews 11.8 factor into the timing of Genesis 15.6? I think uh, Hebrews 11.8 is, by faith he left Ur of Chaldees. Um, and is not the proper translation of Genesis 15.6, Abraham had believed? No. Well, I'm not a Hebrew expert. I've never... Uh, how could he have believed and still experienced what he did in Genesis 15.6 and in the New Testament keep affirming it. I'm not a Hebrew expert to try to deal with the translation uh, there, but it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, I, I just don't think that trans, translation could be true. What's the word? Had it's believed? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I knew that, but I just forgot it. No, I didn't know that. Okay, they want you to repeat. They need a smart guy to repeat that. Thank you. Well, a lot of people argue, and some of the people in this room argue that it's evolved disjunctive, meaning it goes back to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. But many other people argue it's simply a vav, which means vav is basically the Hebrew letter that means and. And, and so it just means and, and Abraham, and you're making the point that based on the way it's used in 
Galatians 3 and Romans 4, it wouldn't make much sense to tie this back to Genesis 12. But there are people in this room who do. and they Really? Say, Didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But they see, they still sit, but they believe in Genesis 12 that he believed in the coming Messiah for everlasting life. And they sometimes go to the verse where he says he preached the gospel to him beforehand. I agree with you and everything you've said, but that doesn't mean everybody here is going to agree. Uh, and, and there's room for, you know, people to hold different views on that. What is everlasting life? What is eternal life? Yeah, what was the verse in Hebrews? Hebrews 11.8, I, I think the issue is, if Hebrews 11.8 is talking about people living by faith, it says he left Ur of Chaldees. Was he an unbeliever when he left Ur of Chaldees? By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called, called yeah. to go to the place uh, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Yeah, the, the question was, uh, in Hebrews 11, is that describing Abraham as an unbeliever? That's the question that's being asked there. Yes, I think so. He had faith. Just didn't have faith in Jesus for everlasting life. What is everlasting life and what is eternal life? I think they're the same. They're just two different English translations of the same word in my understanding. Maybe you should explain what everlasting life is. Everlasting life is life with God that lasts forever. Uh, yeah, it's also a quality of life with God that lasts forever. In Genesis 12, 8, Abraham built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Can an unsaved person call on the name of the Lord? That's a good question. Um, I think it, you know, I, I thought of this and I thought that question might come up. You know, Cornelius in Acts 10 was praying to God. Um, you know, that's calling upon the name of the Lord, and yet he was unsaved. I mean, there is unsaved people can call upon God, call upon the name of God, but they're not in a relationship with God. I think when Paul talks about it in Romans, he's talking about the uh, call in the true sense as one who has that relationship with God. But an unsaved person can call upon the name of the Lord in an unsaved state, I think. Oh, well, I... In Romans 4, 5, is Paul laying down a gauntlet for saving faith? That is, when he says to him who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, is he saying a person has, needs to understand there are no works involved? Yes. Was Abraham saved when he asked God to spare Sodom? Yes. <laughs> it's after Genesis 15, it's just, it's after Genesis 15, 6, right? I'm just reading the question. Yeah, I know. But I, you're here, you're here to help me, Ken. <laughs> That's... Well, I was, I was asked to ask didn't this one last. Didn't you not listen to uh, Sean Lazar about who is your neighbor? <laughs> well, you stand there and say, I'm just reading the question. <laughs> I'm not going to help you. <laughs> oh. oh, I was supposed to ask this one last. So, uh, isn't God eternal rather than everlasting? Uh, there's something going on with that question that I don't understand. I, 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 I think that eternal and everlasting are synonymous, but maybe somebody can help me understand something I don't uh, know. Oh, no beginning. Some eternal people, means past. Yes. Implies past. Directions. Okay, everlasting implies future. 
Well, I knew there must be something I didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah, some people, I've had some people tell me they don't like it when I say when we believe in Jesus, we get eternal life because they say only God's eternal. And so, therefore, there are a lot of people who want to translate it always everlasting life. But most people that read English don't see the distinction, right? So Okay, it's a theological, uh, not a uh, lexical yeah. It's not a word definition, it's a theological, it's really a theological. Co construct. Yeah. Okay. Last question, I was asked to make this one the last question. Who is your favorite grandchild? <laughs> I, there is, there is, yeah, yeah, yes, that's a good answer. 